Retreat from Gettysburg, Part 1, July 3. After the failed attack at Gettysburg on the afternoon of July 3, General Lee decided his army must retreat back to Virginia. They were deep in enemy territory and facing a bigger army that had just beaten them. More Union armies were moving in from the west and from the north. Union cavalry was operating in his rear on his supply line and he was critically low on ammunition with no word on resupply. This map shows the situation on July 4. The gray squares are the nine Confederate divisions. The blue squares are the seven Union Corps. The blue diagonals are two Union Cavalry divisions. The gray diagonal is the one Confederate Cavalry division. The two wagon icons are the Harmon and Imboden convoys. The U.S. flag marks Meade's headquarters and the Confederate flag marks Lee's headquarters. The Potomac River is off to the west, and here's Hagerstown and Williamsport and South Mountain. The two opposing commanders are General Robert E. Lee for the Confederacy and General George Meade for the Union. General Lee's communication and supply line and also a likely line of retreat, ran across South Mountain to Chambersburg, then down the Cumberland Valley across the Potomac and south into Virginia. General Meade's supply line led southeast to Westminster and then back to the capital at Washington, D.C. The first priority for General Lee now was the safety of his army. He needed to reposition his forces to face a counterattack and to be closer to his line of retreat. So accordingly, on the evening of the 3rd, he ordered Ewell's Corps on his left to abandon its positions in the town and around Culp's and Cemetery Hills and pull back to the northwest behind Oak Ridge. He ordered Longstreet's Corps on his right to pull back from its position between Round Top and the Peach Orchard and move behind Seminary Ridge. General Meade had two priorities. First was to protect Washington and Baltimore and to keep his army between those cities and Lee's army. The second and conflicting priority was to defeat Lee's army. So, a question about this second priority. Was defeating Lee at Gettysburg enough? Meade's army had done that. Did he have to also catch and destroy the Army of Northern Virginia before it escaped? Or was it enough to just chase Lee's army back into Virginia? Meade struggled with that question. General Meade considered a counterattack late on the 3rd, but was unable to get it organized before dark. July 4. The next priorities for General Lee, after the safety of his army, were his wounded troops and his supplies. Some of the wounded would have to be left behind, but Bradley Godfrey in his book, The Maps of Gettysburg, totals the number of wounded that were carried back to Virginia as greater than 12,000 men. And then his supply convoys. Armies traveled with convoys of quartermaster and ordnance wagons. Before the battle, General Meade sent his wagons back down the Baltimore Pike to a spot near Westminster, but General Lee's trains were close by, near Fairfield. The wounded and his supplies needed to be safely on their way before his army started its retreat. Through the evening of the 3rd and the early morning of the 4th, Lee and his staff organized two wagon trains. One included the wagons for Longstreet and Hill's Corps, plus those for Stewart's Cavalry Division, and it included the convoy of wounded. The other wagon train would contain the wagons for Ewell's Corps, plus the reserve train which is a term of art for all of Ewell's booty. The livestock, food, forage, and other confiscated supplies gathered up during their time on the north side of the Potomac. For speed and safety, the two convoys would follow separate routes to the Potomac. One route was longer and safer over the Cashtown Gap and through Greencastle. The other was a shorter, harder route through Fairfield and over Monterey Pass. General Lee counted on using the fords at Williamsport and a pontoon bridge of Falling Waters to cross the Potomac, but 
On the 4th, Union Cavalry destroyed the bridge. And then that night it started raining. So when Lee's army reached the Potomac, there was no bridge, and the water was too deep to use the fords. I'll start the animation running right here. The first convoy left at 3 a.m. on the 4th, and this was the convoy which included the reserve train, and it traveled through Fairfield and over Monterey Pass. It was commanded by the quartermaster for Ewell's Corps, Major John Harmon. And note the Federal Cavalry Division that started for Frederick shortly afterwards. The convoy carrying the wounded was turned over to Brigadier General John M. Bowden, who was normally commander of M. Bowden's Cavalry Brigade. That convoy traveled the longer route via Cashtown Gap, and they left around 4 in the afternoon on the 4th, headed through Cashtown Gap for Greencastle. Lee's Army also had about 5,500 Union prisoners, and Pickett's division was assigned to escort them south to Virginia. General Meade's situation at Gettysburg was not comfortable. Confederate troops had ripped up the railroad lines in Pennsylvania, which forced the Army of the Potomac to use Westminster as a railhead. If Lee was retreating to the south, Meade would follow and move his supply base to Frederick in Maryland. If Lee wasn't retreating, he'd repair the rail lines and use Gettysburg as a railhead, which was it. For the moment, he was relying on Westminster for supplies, which was too far away. So both generals had issues with supplies. Lee had supplies and wanted to carry them back to Virginia. And Meade, on the other hand, was relying on a supply line, which right now was stretched thin. General Meade's priorities were to rest his army, and try to get supplies flowing from Westminster, and to find out what Lee was doing. Meade felt the intelligence about whether Lee was withdrawing or not was unclear. General Meade ordered a reconnaissance of the battlefield during the 4th and told the 6th Corps to be ready to move as support for that recon. On the afternoon and evening of the 4th, Lee's three infantry corps started their retreat. And the information I have on exactly when they started is conflicting and vague, but the times I use in my map are these. Hill's Corps left first at 5 p.m. on the 4th, and Longstreet and Ewell's Corps followed around 1 in the morning of the 5th. July 5. Back to the two Confederate convoys carrying supplies and wounded. And I turned the clock back on the animation to the 4th to track the convoys and the cavalry. When the convoys left Gettysburg, they were spotted almost immediately by Federal Signal Corps lookouts. The convoys were juicy targets and plans were launched to intercept them. Buford and Kilpatrick's Union Cavalry Divisions were guarding the Army supply base at Westminster. General Pleasanton, the Union Cavalry Corps commander, sent them to intercept and destroy the Confederate convoys. Buford went southwest through Frederick before heading for Williamsport, and Kilpatrick went northwest heading for Monterey Pass. As Kilpatrick passed through Emmitsburg on the evening of the 4th, see that Stuart's division started to move. Stuart passed around behind the Confederate lines and headed south for Emmitsburg. Apparently Stuart's job at this point was to screen Lee's right flank. In meantime, Kilpatrick continued west into the night headed for Monterey Pass. And I'll zoom in here to get a closer look at the area around the pass. Gettysburg is on the upper right, Hagerstown on the lower left. In the center is South Mountain, and Monterey Pass is probably about here. It rained heavily that night. The head of Harmon's convoy was apparently already past Hagerstown when the fight started, but it was a long, slow-moving convoy, and the body of the convoy was still in the pass when Kilpatrick attacked. And again, Harmon's convoy carried the wagons for Ewell's Corps and the reserve train. The fighting started around 10 on the night of the 4th. Kilpatrick's Union Cavalry were pushing uphill in the dark and rain and ran into a small Confederate blocking force at Monterey. That blocking force was a company of Confederate cavalry, about 90 men, supported by one cannon with six rounds of ammo, commanded by Captain George Emack. 
Kilpatrick's Union force, as far as I know, consisted of his entire division, and Philip Leno in his book, Gettysburg Campaign Atlas, credits Kilpatrick's division with more than 3,500 men. The fight might have lasted about an hour. Kilpatrick's troopers finally broke through the escort and ranged up and down the convoy in the darkness of early morning, burning and shooting. And Philip Leno credits Kilpatrick's cavalry with capturing almost 300 wagons and ambulances and a thousand prisoners. I'll quote from Kilpatrick's report where he describes the fight at Monterey. And you can take this with a grain of salt. Knowing that the train of wagons was passing, I gave battle, forced my way through the pass, drove back the rebel cavalry and artillery. We passed on, reached the train, barricaded the road in our rear, and the entire train from the mountains to Ridgeville was in my possession." Unquote. Kilpatrick's division continued to the west side of South Mountain and then south to Smithsburg, arriving maybe early in the afternoon on the 5th. And now I'll back up a bit. We'll pick up Stewart's part of the story. Stewart's cavalry reached Emmitsburg about dawn on the 5th and heard from locals that Kilpatrick had passed through the day before, headed for Monterey Pass. And Stewart wrote that he felt the pass was adequately guarded. And there was no need to divert from where his orders sent him. Stewart decided he could continue to Smithsburg. As he emerged from the mountains on the afternoon of the 5th, Stewart's division ran into Kilpatrick's pickets, and Union artillery that was placed along the road to Boonesboro. A battle followed, with Stuart pushing down from the northeast and Kilpatrick defending his position in the town. Kilpatrick was driven out of Smithsburg and rode on south to Boonesboro, arriving just before midnight on the 5th. And Stuart spent the night at Smithsburg. The head of both of the convoys arrived at Williamsport on the afternoon of the 5th. Harmon's train had been ambushed at Monterey, as I just described. Imboden's train was ambushed at Greencastle by pro-Union civilians, south of Greencastle, by a force of about 100 Union cavalry, led by Captain Ulrich Dahlgren, and then at Cunningham's Crossroads, by about 200 cavalry, led by Captain Abram Jones. Regardless, the bulk of both trains got through to Williamsport, and then found that their way across the river was blocked. The bottomlands along the riverbank became a huge parking lot as wagons kept pouring in and waited to cross. Generals Meade and Lee continued their chess game. General Meade directed the Sixth Corps to find out what Lee was up to, as described in the book One Continuous Fight by Wittenberg, Petruzzi, and Nugent. On the morning of July 5, Meade ordered Sedgwick to push his corps hard toward the enemy's last known positions at Gettysburg to determine their intentions and whether Lee intended to make a stand at South Mountain, unquote. Meade suspected that Lee, rather than moving back into Virginia, might instead be withdrawing into the mountains with the intent of fortifying them. The Sixth Corps marched about six miles in the rain across the battlefield at about six that evening, caught up to the rear guard of Ewell's Corps near Fairfield. There was an exchange of small arms and artillery fire, and Wittenberg wrote in his book that Lee hoped the Federal Army would attack. Wittenberg says Fairfield Gap at that point was about 100 yards wide, and quotes a witness that, Lee halted our corps and told General Ewell to try to induce the enemy to fight. If those people will only come out of their entrenchments and give us an open field fight, we will smash them. I never saw General Lee so anxious for a fight." Unquote. According to Kent Masterson Brown, writing in his book, Retreat from Gettysburg, at mid-morning on the 5th, General Meade circulated orders for the Army of the Potomac to march south to Middletown, Maryland. And then he read Sedgwick's reports on General Lee's bold rearguard action at Fairfield. The reports fed into his uncertainty. What was Lee doing? And Meade canceled the order to march south. Because Union cavalry were sent west chasing the Confederate convoys, Meade's supply line and left flank were now unprotected. And Meade sent one corps south to Marsh Creek to guard his left flank and two other corps east to guard his supply line. 
That evening, while Ewell's corps was at Fairfield, facing the Sixth Corps, Hill and Longstreet's corps were on South Mountain. July 6. Meade ordered his troops to restart their movement to the south. At the front of the Union advance, three of the seven infantry corps marched to Emmitsburg in Maryland. By that evening, Longstreet's corps had reached Hagerstown, Hill's corps was past Leitersburg, and Ewell's corps was near Waynesboro. The heads of both of the Confederate convoys had reached the river and found the bridge at Falling Waters was destroyed and the river was too high to ford at Williamsport. The wagons continued piling up at Williamsport, waiting for a chance to cross the river. Both Buford and Kilpatrick were still following Pleasanton's order to attack the enemy's rear and lines of communication. Buford rode from Frederick to attack Williamsport. Kilpatrick rode from Boonesboro to attack Hagerstown. And I'll zoom in again to focus in on the action at Hagerstown here and Williamsport here. Boonesboro is to the south and east here. In Williamsport, Imboden erected an improvised defense. He positioned artillery in an arc east of town and scraped together whatever other forces he could find. Wagons were still streaming into town from Greencastle in Pennsylvania. And as Philip Lano wrote, in time, Imboden is able to bandage together a force of about 2,500 cavalry, teamsters, wagoneers, stragglers, and the wounded, unquote. Kilpatrick attacked north toward Hagerstown. In Hagerstown, there was street-by-street -street fighting as Kilpatrick's cavalry pushed into the town, and they ran into barricaded streets and sharpshooters firing from church cupolas. Brown, in his book, wrote that the Confederate defenders in Hagerstown knew that help was on the way. Iverson's brigade was approaching from the north. Stuart's cavalry from the east. Stuart was still at Smithsburg when he learned that Kilpatrick was attacking Hagerstown. Stuart wrote that he was concerned about Williamsport and the safety of the wagons, and he rushed west, hoping to disrupt Kilpatrick's attack. Stuart's cavalry division was pressing in from the east, and Kilpatrick learned Confederate infantry was approaching, and note Longstreet's corps to the north. Kilpatrick withdrew from the attempt to capture Hagerstown. His division rode on west to Williamsport to support Buford, and they arrived about 7 p.m. Stuart followed, riding west through Hagerstown and on toward Williamsport, and he attacked their rear. At Williamsport, Buford had all three of his brigades, totaling maybe 3,500 men. He attacked Williamsport, trying to reach the wagon trains waiting there. And Buford wrote in his report, The enemy was driven handsomely to within a half mile of his trains in the town when he came out strong enough to prevent our farther progress. Unquote. As darkness fell, Kilpatrick and Buford withdrew southeast to Jones's Crossroads, arriving around 10 p.m. Summarizing the battles for Hagerstown and Williamsport, Ryan and Shaw's wrote in their book, Lee is Trapped and Must Be Taken. The Union cavalry's tactics and timing proved inadequate. Buford's stalwart defensive stand at Gettysburg in the morning of July 1 did not translate into aggressive offensive action against a weaker foe with his back to a swollen river five days later, unquote. And Brown in his book wrote, The day had been a fiasco. Unquote. July 7. The Southern Infantry concentrated around Hagerstown. Pickett's division, escorting the Union prisoners, arrived at Williamsport, and work began on building a new bridge at Falling Waters. The Army of the Potomac's march to the south kicked into high gear. The Northern Infantry moved into Maryland, and they were aiming to concentrate around Middletown, which was west of their supply depot, which was now at Frederick. Meade's plan was to move them into the Cumberland Valley through Turner's Gap here. Buford and Kilpatrick moved from Jones's Crossroad east to Boonesboro, and there's some fighting in their front south of Funkstown. Two opposing cavalry regiments fought back and forth along the road between Williamsport and Boonesboro. And the battle's not mentioned in Stewart's report, but Buford cited in his report a successful brush with the enemy's advance, unquote. Stuart moved from Hagerstown south 
to Downsville. For the last seven days to the crossing of the Potomac on July 14, see Part 2.